I was a little bit tired when I got through with that break dancing for that video. That's a lot for an old guy. And it made me sweat because I was wearing that wig, the one with hair. Good job, Doug. But today's baptism day. We baptized 11 or 12 in the early service. I think we got 31 or 2 this service. Excited. Got to leave a little time, so I'm going to preach real fast. But before I do, let me mention that the women are selling for the missions tea. It's going to be a fancy affair out in the foyer. They're going to sell some tickets. And also that we have both $32 and $22 tickets for that Mercy Me something avenue people. And uh, <laughs> so the 32 ones are out there for sale. But the 22 is for the fifth graders because we're going as a group. And any youth that want to go, and they'll be available Wednesdays or whatever, so you be sure and see us. Uh, because they, they, were, they had a, a certain group that was there, and we had to get some of both. So because they're selling out quick, uh, I guess it's uh, really going to be an awesome uh, concert. And uh, I'm pretty pumped uh, about life and being alive and that my heart is pumping and I'm not dead. <laughs> and for those of you, <laughs> very nice. And for those of you Kansas fans, I do not grieve over your loss to Baylor. Not even a little bit. I don't know who you are because I forget hurtful things quickly because I'm a forgiver. But every time Kansas has beaten Baylor, you let me know on the way out. This is the first time Baylor's beaten Kansas, so I'm gloating for a moment. Just a moment. Today we're talking about baptism and uh, there are three baptisms uh, in living the baptized life, so you'll hear that theme throughout the, the message. There are three baptisms mentioned in the Bible. Uh, the Bible mentions that, uh, number one, the Holy Spirit baptizes into Jesus. That's, a, that's redemption. That's salvation. That's born again by the Spirit. There's no reason to get in the waters of baptism unless you first have the Spirit of God enter your life and save you. Salvation is not an agreement to theology. Many of us agree, disagree on certain theology things. It doesn't matter. You agree, what we got to agree on is Jesus and his character and his love, his saving power, that he came, born of a virgin, lived a sinless life. He died on the cross for our sins. He was buried the third day, he rose again. But not believing, believing is not enough. It's when the Holy Spirit comes and speaks to you and captures your heart and changes your heart and you're born again by spirit. Nicodemus said he didn't understand being born again. He said, how can a man go back in his mother's womb and be born? Not talking about born again of flesh. He's talking about spiritual birth by the Holy Spirit. And the first baptism is the Holy Spirit baptizes us into Jesus. And it's mentioned in uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 13. Pastor Zach, I love him even though he's a bit weird. And he always says, world change, note takers are world changers, or world changers are note takers, or something like that. Now, it's not biblical, so I don't have to get it exactly right. But 1 Corinthians <laughs> chapter 12, verse 13, it's a good principle, though. 1 Corinthians 12, 13, write it down. For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and all have been made to drink into one spirit. We're born again by the spirit. The Bible talks about it in Romans 8. Your spirit led... You do the things of the Spirit, you're the Son of God. If you live by the flesh, your own strength, if you've got religious rights and wrongs and rules, right? That's all you do in your own strength, you're dead. You're dead. You're dead in your trespass and sin. Only Jesus, by His Spirit, can make a spiritual birth. He comes in and He reveals Jesus Christ to you. It's a powerful happening that I experienced, and um, it was incredible the power of God's grace that invaded my heart. Uh, and, and changed my life. And, and while I've struggled, I've made a lot of mistakes along the way. Jesus is faithful, like the song we sang, and he keeps coming back to me, keeps drawing me back, and keeps helping me. And today, if you feel like, man, I'm a, I'm a loser, 
I, I'm, I'm a sinner. I'm, I'm this, I'm that. I, I can never get God's forgiveness. I've done too. No, that is not true. That's the enemy. The Bible calls him. He is the liar and father of lies. He's a man of darkness, and he points the accusing finger, and he's always going to make you feel dirty. And Jesus offers cleanliness. He offers forgiveness. He offers grace if we'll come to him. And today, at the close of the service, Pastor Jeff's going to come up and give you an opportunity to invite Jesus into your heart and be baptized into Jesus as the Holy Spirit comes to you and reveals him and changes you. The second baptism is the disciples bapt the baptizes us in water. Uh, John the Baptist, and we call it the baptism of repentance, uh, the baptism of salvation, the, the, the you know John's baptism, whatever it might be. And we'll, this is what the message is about. So I'm not going to read anything on that. And then the last one is that Jesus baptizes us in the Holy Spirit, and this is for power to live and to witness. The Bible is full of it, and, it's, and we always call that the Holy Spirit baptism. It's not. It's the baptism of Jesus. Every gospel mentions it, where Jesus pours his Spirit into us. In fact, he said, if I don't go away, the Spirit won't come. It's good that I go away, because if I, if I go away, I'll send the Spirit. And he will guide you into all truth, and he will convict you of sin and of righteousness and judgment to come. He will lead you and guide you and be with you and empower you to be witnesses. The Spirit will bear fruit in your life. It is the power of God himself on earth in us to bear the fruit that you would live in love. You would be kind. You would be patient. You'd be faithful. You'd be gentle. That's the essence of who God is in us. So Jesus isn't on earth. He's there, but he sent his spirit. And the, every gospel mentions this, that Jesus is the one that baptizes in the Holy Spirit. Every one of them. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew 3.11. John says, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he who's coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. And then Mark 1.8. Mark them down. I indeed baptize you with water, John said, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Luke 3.16, you can remember that because of John 3.16, it's Luke 3.16. I indeed baptize you with water, John said, but one mightier than I is coming, whose sandal strap I'm not even worthy to loose. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. By the way, I'm using the New King James Version, so what's on the screen may be a little different. What's in your Bible? Mark that down, Luke 3.16. And John says in John 1.33, I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize... I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, Upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And we know when Jesus was baptized with water, the Bible says the Spirit of God descended upon him in the form of a dove. And God spoke, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. So this is Jesus, Jesus' baptism with the Spirit. They all confirm that Jesus baptizes with the Spirit. But today we're talking about water baptism. Water baptism, one of the three baptisms, is, is a sign of God's covenant made without hands. The Bible calls it a sign of covenant made without hands. You see, in the Old Testament, when God made a covenant with Abraham, he sealed that covenant with circumcision. There was an outward sign of the covenant, which was circumcision. That's what the Jews held on to. That's the Hebrew children was circumcision. In the New Testament, that it's no longer circumcision. It's water baptism. And it says it right in this passage. Mark it down. It's Colossians 2, 11 and 12. And in him you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, made without hands, in the removal of the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised up with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him up from the dead. So the baptism replaces circumcision. You remember as Christians, when the Gentiles came, the Jews wanted all of them to have to be circumcised. Remember, that's the whole book of Galatians is about. That the legal side, everybody has to be Jewish through the circumcision. And God's talking about a different sign, a different piece of his covenant, which is water baptism. It's a very important thing. It's not just a take it or leave it type of a, an event, okay? And so when it comes to water baptism, many times we come up with what we think or our, our, our past church history or what our grandparents or great-grandparents or parents taught us or what we think. But here's the bottom line. This book is authority. This book declares God's word and God's purpose and the truth of his will. 
The very word baptize, it had many meanings, but they used it with different sentences back in the day of Christ. But the, 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 the meaning, the depth of the meaning is simply to immerse. Now, I realize there are times that people are sick and I've done this where they can't get to an immersion tank and you sprinkle them. There's nothing wrong with that. But I'm going to say to you that if you've repented and you've been born by the Spirit and you've had the Spirit baptize you into the body of Christ and you're a believer, a Christian, headed to heaven, the next step is that you would submit to the command of Jesus to be baptized biblically in the submersion waters of baptism of repentance. Of Jesus Christ. So I, I, I submit that you ask yourself that question, have you ever been baptized in that way? See, water baptized is pictured in the story of Moses, secondly. When God delivered his people, Israel, out of bondage in Egypt, they passed miraculously through the parted waters of the Red Sea. They passed out of slavery into freedom and a new life. The chariots of Egypt were drowned in those same waters. This is a picture of Christian baptism. You see, when we trust in Christ, we're liberated from our bondage, our selfishness, and our sin, and we're set free to live a new resurrected life. He sets us free. It's resurrected life in Christ. And we're baptized as we, as we pass through the waters from slavery into freedom, and our old life is destroyed, much like Pharaoh's army. And there's a scripture in the New Testament that points to this, that water baptism is pictured in the story of Moses. And it's 1 Corinthians 10, 1 and 2, mark it down. For I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Not only is water baptism pictured in the story of Moses and is a sign of God's covenant made without hands, but water baptism is the, was the practice of the early church. So when we obey the Lord in baptism, we're following him in baptism. We're following the pattern of the early churches we find in Acts of the Apostles in the book of Acts. The first time after the Holy Spirit came in Acts 2, it records when they asked Peter, when they were convicted, well, what do we do? And then Peter tells them, and I'll read that, Acts 2, 36 and 38, right down that passage. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, Peter said, both Lord and Christ. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said to them, repent, that's to turn, turn from, to turn from, repent, that's repenting from sin, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. That's water baptism. And you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, and there he's referring to what had just happened, which was the descending of the Spirit recorded in Acts 2. Another time that water baptism throughout Acts is mentioned is Acts 2.41. They, they were baptized, added to the church daily, so such were saved. In Acts 8, 36 and 38, there's another time that, that was years later, okay, that a different group were saved and they were baptized. And then later there's Gentiles. You see in Acts 10, verses 47 and 48, all these water baptisms. And it was 18 years later that we get to uh, uh, Acts 16, verse 30, 34. 18 years later, the book of Galatians, Paul had already written. James had written his book. This is 18 years after Jesus ascended in Acts chapter 1 and went up to heaven. After the day of Pentecost, 18 years, and he says this, they're still baptizing this same way. And he says this in Acts 16, 30 to 34, and he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? So they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And that word believe isn't just a belief in Jesus. This word is the action word for faith. It's to trust and obey. There is a relational commitment that you make like a marriage with Jesus Christ, where you're devoted one to another to honor one another. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved, you and your household, if, if they also believe is what it's saying. You're not saved. You don't save your household because you believe. Anyone in your household that believes. And then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them in the same hour of the night and washed their stripes. And immediately he and all his family were baptized. And now when he had brought them into the house, he set food before them. And he rejoiced having believed in God with all of his household. So there's still the pattern. The next thing is water baptism was a pattern of the early church, and it's also the example of Jesus. Jesus himself insisted from his cousin, 
John, that he be baptized. John, and so he says, then Jesus, Matthew 3, 13 to 17, mark it down. Jesus arrived from Galilee at the Jordan coming to John to be baptized by him. But John tried to prevent him. He said, I have need to be baptized by you, and you come to me? But Jesus answering said to him, permit it at this time. And for in this way, it is fitting for us to fulfill all the righteousness. Then John permitted him. And after being baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water. And behold, the, and notice it says Jesus came up from the water. He didn't just get sprinkled. Came up from the water. And behold, the heavens were open, and he saw the Spirit of God descending as a dove and lighting on him. It wasn't a dove that lighted on him. It was the Spirit of God, like a dove. And I'm telling you, when you get baptized today or any time, I'm telling you the Holy Spirit wants to be upon you. It's God on earth. It's the Spirit of God. He's here. He's among us. He's with us. He's in us. He guides us. He helps us. He's all power. He's God Almighty on earth and in you. So he descends on us and uh, in this like a dove lighting on behold a voice of the heaven said and I believe God is looking down smiling today at you, the sons and daughters this is his sons and daughters being baptized this is my beloved son and I'm well pleased so it's an example of Jesus not only that water baptism is a watery grave it symbolizes the death the burial and the resurrection of Jesus and this is the primary passage about we see uh, what baptism, the, the spiritual significance of water baptism is Romans chapter 6. Well, you can remember that he's been talking about that we're saved by grace. He's talking about uh, that uh, it's the power of God. It's all God's work. But then he says, because grace is so great, do you go on sinning? And here it is in Romans chapter 6 in verse number 1 through 7. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Let me tell you something. There's a popular thing. Everybody sins. Nobody's perfect. I know sinless perfection is a stretch for a lot of people. And I'm not, I'm not going to address it other than that. But I am going to say this. It's ridiculous just to go, well, everybody sins, so just go on and do your sin. You got your sin. I got my sin. That is not what the Bible teaches. In fact, when it says you willfully go on in your sin because everybody's got their sin, it says you're trampling on the blood of Jesus. The Hebrew writer wrote it. And you're insulting the spirit of grace. It's not to be. But Jesus, when he'd heal someone, and he'd forgive their sin, he goes, now go and sin no more. See, there is something about intentionally drawing close to God and realizing in myself I cannot live like God wants me to. So that's why every day humility says I get on my face before God and I say, God, help me, fill me, strengthen me. I read the word, it's fresh daily bread that can give me strength, spiritual strength to live in a way that otherwise I couldn't live. It's God in me. It's the Spirit of God alive in me, helping me. And I'll tell you, many a times I've stepped outside the Holy Spirit life to my flesh life, and every time I fall flat on my face and embarrass myself. And some of you have done the same, and you know what it's like. You can't do this on your own. That's why we have, well, I need you every hour. I need you every 15 minutes. I'm going to write the song, I need you every second, because three seconds later I might curse. Seven seconds after that I might lust, and I might steal something 15 seconds later. Oh, I need you. Yes, I need you. In my flesh, it's wicked and evil. But God, you're the only good thing in me. Because the Romans says there's none like God. No one is good like God. Only God is good. Amen? Amen. Ooh, I should write a rap to that or something like that. that. And by the way, that was all right here in my notes. See me after church. I'll sell you some uh, land in Florida. It's an example of Jesus. It's also the watery grave. It's why I stop there. Or do you not know that all of us have been baptized into Christ and have been baptized into his death? There it is. When you're baptized into Christ, you've been baptized into his death. What did Jesus do? He died and he was buried. What do you do when someone dies? You bury them. You don't just sprinkle a little dirt on them. You put them under the ground. They're dead. They're buried. Right? Buried. And that's what we do. When we enter, we're saying, I'm going to obey you. I'm going to die to my will, to myself, to my flesh, what I want. And your will matters. And I'm going to follow the Spirit. And I'm going to ask you to help me so that a new life can be lived out in me. So there is a, a focus, a dedication that when I was going to go into the watery grave, I'm dying to myself. And I'm going to, that Christ might live because I'm in the way. Christ can't live when I'm living. 
right? I like to talk about a seed. Unless a seed, uh, Jesus told the parable, goes in the ground and dies, it cannot bear wheat. It can't grow. So we must die. And Luke says you die daily by taking up your cross and following him daily. You lay aside your life. So we live the baptized life. We live it day by day. We're baptized into his death. Therefore, we've been buried with him through baptism into death so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For we have become united with him in the likeness of his death. United with him in the likeness of his death. Certainly, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Meaning, when you're buried, Jesus, up from the grave, he arose. Guess what? When you're buried, that bodily resurrection that 1 Corinthians 15 talks about is a reality, and it's going to happen. They're going to know no grave going to hold this body down. It goes on, says, knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. For he has died, for he who has died is free from sin. We are dead. We don't not, to be, we don't not have to be slaves to sin. We're more than conquerors in Jesus Christ. And lastly, water baptism is obedience to the command of Jesus. In the Great Commission, Jesus tells his disciples to go and make disciples, which is obedient followers of Christ. That's what a disciple is. And baptize them. And it's in the name of God the Father, Jesus the Son. He only says Son, but it's Jesus the Son and the Holy Spirit. It's Jesus who is the Son. And it says this in the command, Matthew 28, 18 to 20. And Jesus came, came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. So he's going to give it to them. He says, Go, therefore, and make disciples. And he gave them his name. and gave them his word. and gave them his spirit so they could go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I command you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. That's the Great Commission. It is that we water baptism. It is obedience to Jesus' command. Now, John the Baptist, they believe, was a member of the Essenes, the Jewish Essenes down in Qumran, where we, we find that they were not John himself, but they were uh, the ones that wrote out what we found uh, was the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls. And they wrote scripture and they lived it very clearly. You would see that the Essenes followed even before Jesus did the Sermon on the Mount. The Essenes would be following the teaching of James, the half-brother of Jesus, and of Jesus that says, if you love me, you keep my commandments. And what they would say about water baptism is that water baptism is a commitment to obey. It means nothing unless you obey. See, the Jewish in that day before baptism became the Christian uh, covenant of, of grace, that we do publicly, before that happened, the, the Jews would go into mitzvah baths. And it had to be fresh water. You'd go in one side and come out the other. And it was a purification uh, a, a rite, R-I-T-E, a purification ceremony. And any time a woman had her monthly or, or a, a person touched a dead person or any other type of thing, so they were often, when they go to the temple to worship, they'd go into the mitzvah baths. And if you go to Israel, you can see them. They're there. The ruins are there. It was a big thing. And John says, it doesn't mean anything. You go into that water, you go in one side of the midst of the bath and come on out the other way, and you're going to go on out there and do whatever you want, and you don't want to obey. He says, it is about the heart. And John and Jesus and the brothers, Brother James and throughout and Paul taught that it's about the heart, not about the ceremony. This is a public act that Jesus said is one of the two uh, 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 ordinances of the church water baptism and communion and jesus instituted both of them he said it here when we preach the gospel to baptize and he said this is my blood and this is my body and i'm telling you what we're doing here today is very important it's biblical and we're going to do it the way the bible says it ought to be done and if you hadn't been baptized you need to be baptized you haven't been saved when pastor jeff comes in a minute you need to be saved quickly write these down you can get them later online listen back Six reasons to be baptized. It's commanded by Jesus. It's public confession of our faith. Jesus said, if you do deny me before man, I'll deny you before God. Public confession of our faith. It's a picture of what happened to you at salvation. You died to the old man. You, you took up your own cross. 
You said no to your will, and you rose up a new man, a new life with the Spirit of God in you. It's a picture of what happened to you at salvation. You identify yourself as a part of the body of Christ, okay, because we all come to Jesus the same way. It doesn't matter where you live, who you are, what's your money, how old, how young. doesn't matter. You all come to Jesus the same way to God. You're a part of the body of Christ, and it drives a stake. Boom. It's a moment in your life when you drive a stake and you say, I'm a follower of Jesus. And I'm going to follow him. You declare you're a follower. And finally, it affirms your belief in Christ that he died on that cross, he was buried, and he rose again. And your belief that you too shall rise because he lives, we shall live, and he is Christ forevermore.